Thank you. Thank you and welcome. Uh, just two little, three little pieces of background here. I, my formal training as an economist is, is in, in economic development and I got, I, I got into this field in the 1970s when we were beginning to look at uh, microelectronic technology and economic development. Uh, we predicted that Singapore would develop based on micro microelectronics. Uh, nobody agreed with us, but Singapore proved us right. Um, and I've segued over towards some of the go governance issues, which is what I'm going to talk about tonight, mainly because there's a, there's, there are extremely important negotiations and discussions underway at the moment that are going to determine where the, how the internet is governed at, at the highest level. Uh, and what I'm going to try and do is parse that out as to where we are today, what's going on, who the players are. And the three, the three things, you, and I'm not going to give many references, but the three websites you might want to keep track of are ICANN, ICANN.org, INPOC, which is the Nonprofit Operational Concerns Constituency inside ICANN. I'm the chair of the policy committee there. And then the Internet Society. Uh, this is the Canadian uh, URL, uh, but the, the Internet Society in general, I'll talk a little bit about it. Uh, as well. Um, and so I'm going to do three things. I'm first going to talk a little bit about what, what we mean by the internet ecosystem, but I'm going to do it in a way that frames it for what I want to talk about next. And I'm going to talk a little bit about where multi-stakeholder governance comes in in all of this. Uh, and then I'm going to talk about a very specific activity called the IANA transition, which is mandated by the U.S. government. This, the, the U.S. government announced in March of last year that the the stewardship and oversight of this level of governance of the global internet that the U.S. government was going to hand it off. The U.S. government has had it since the, the, the early 1990s when, when, uh, the, when IANA was created, and I'll explain what those are in a minute. Uh, just to drive home the point that the internet itself and the World Wide Web on top of that are fairly young, uh, Vint Cerf, who you'll see occasionally in the news because he's, he's Google's internet evangelist, that's what they pay him to be, uh, and Steve Cooper, who's the head of the board of ICANN, are two of the four or five people who invented the internet. They're still there and they're still in positions of power. It's that young. Okay, so um, Jan Postel, who was very, very important, just tragically died young and is kind of revered as, as, as the ghost of Jan Postel is, is always present in any kind of discussion. Uh, okay, so the internet ecosystem. What do we mean by it? I, I have to say a little bit in very simple terms about a way of thinking about the internet. First of all, it's the connected infrastructure, the cables, the wires, the devices, and so forth. And the two things about it is that it moves digital signals and it moves them for the most part according to the internet protocol. And the internet protocol is the thing, if you go back to the US military's funding of the research in Southern California, the so-called ARPNET, what they were trying to do was to figure out a way to, to get a message from point A to point B, no matter how much disruption took place between point A and point B. I'll explain on that a little bit. Uh, so IP addresses, the two kind, their names and numbers. So you'll see that turn up in what ICANN stands for. Okay. Then there are the virtual activities, the humans and the machine driven ones. We're either requesting information, providing information, requesting instructions or providing instructions. Those three very simple phrases capture everything that the internet does. Sometimes it's people talking to people, sometimes it's machines talking to machines, and it'll be increasingly machines talking to machines. And the result here is this a virtual and real space. It's the, we don't have the real world and the virtual world. We have the literal world and the virtual world. And together, they're the real space in which humans do things. We organize our lives. We build organizational stru structures. We ca carry on processes. And I conveniently break it down to saying, OK, they're unique literal structures like taxis and hotels. There are unique virtual structures and processes like Uber in place of taxis. It uses real things. And Airbnb. But, but what's happening is that th this area, and there's some things that can be done both ways, 
these fungible structures, you can, you can do them either physically or, or virtually, this part is beginning to eat up big chunks of that part in a whole variety of ways. It's highly disruptive. Apple, a very successful, profitable company in the world, has almost no physical infrastructure. It's got a few stores. Everything else contract. Uber, it's, it has almost no physical anything. It's a major, in terms of revenue, major corporation, but it's outsourced everything. Uh, and it's outsourced it globally. So, so that's what I mean about the ecosystem. And that what's happening is like the atmosphere, it increasingly engulfs and, and embraces everything we do. And, if, and we're only at like phase one. Think of this as, as, as the nut. There's a forest about to grow up around it. Unlike the atmosphere, it's, human it's a human construction, and it's, its behavior and dynamics are by, desi by design. We're, we're building it. Sometimes it runs in directions we don't like. Sometimes it goes in directions we like. So the questions, and I'm not going to go into these questions now, but we can come back to them later, are how are its principles and rules determined? Who sets the, you know, how this ecosystem works? Um, how does it impact on the individual, my personal privacy, the community? the social dynamics of the community, uh, society, the economy, and the polity. How, you know, how do the individual and society exercise citizenship and stewardship toward this ecosystem? The notion, the notion of an internet citizenship is ill-defined now, poorly defined. It'll be more defined later on. There are lots of what, why, and how questions, and I'm not gonna, you know, you can throw those up once we get to uh, uh, the open session, but I, I've got 19 slides. I'm going to go through them fairly fast so that you get a sense of, of what's, what's happening and then we'll drill down on what, where your interests lie. Okay. What is the Internet Protocol? It's really important to understand it in very simple terms. If I wanted to send something to, to Meta in an old-fashioned way, I get a container, I fill it full of contents, and I send it to her. UPS delivers it, or I carry it, or the mail delivers it, and so forth. And there may be some choices there. Should I go down Young Street to get to it, or should I go down Bathurst to get to it, and so forth. But it's all a package like that. Well, the Internet Protocol, the, the, the brilliance of it was to do the following. To, to have an IP address, and we'll talk about what that is in a minute, to and an IP address from, and then break the contents up into a bunch of like little trains of their own and turn them loose, and all they know is they're coming from there and trying to go there, and if, they have, if somebody's gonna come back, it's gonna come from there to there, uh, and they get there any way they can. So, and, and the idea in military, in, in, in wartime, was if somebody blew up part of the, the communications infrastructure, it didn't matter, because this stuff would just, these pieces would travel around until they got where they're going to go, and when they got there, there were ways of, of putting it back together and checking that all the, all the pieces got there. Uh, some checking, which is beginning to disappear because the quality of the, of the pipes has gotten so good that in the newest version of the Internet Protocol, that's one of the things that they've, they've dropped. So we need numbers, okay. We need these IP numbers, okay. The IP number, IPB, IP version four, uses a 32-bit numerical address written in decimals Four numbers that are like zero, zero, up to zero, up to 255, 256 numbers. Okay, so one York IP address is 130.63.92.20. You plug that into any computer on the internet in the world, it knows it's headed for, for York University. Uh, if, you put, if you put all the zeros in, it looks like that. A UP at U University of Toronto address is, is that one. We have a lot of addresses. The IP uh, version 4 protocol is 32-bit binary. It contains four and a quarter billion addresses, potential addresses, okay? We've used them all up. I mean, some of them are still assigned to locations in the world, and they haven't used their, their allocation up, but there's a way of giving some to Asia, some to Africa, some to Latin America, some to North America, and so forth. That's one of the political processes, technical and political processes. So that's, that's IP version 4. It's being replaced with IP version 6, which is 128 bits and hexadecimal. Uh, it contains that many addresses. To make it more intelligible, IP version 6 is a pool of 340 billion, 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 billion unique addresses. 
okay, which should last us for a while. And that's, and the internet is running out of these numbers. It's going to IP version six. There are technological changes that need to take place there, and it may turn out that some of the newer parts of the world, the three billion people that aren't on the internet yet, when they get on, they're liable to go straight to IP version six, and we will be left with IP version four uh, and be technologically behind them. And, and those changes can happen very fast. I'll talk a little bit about that a little later. Okay. The big demand is going to be for the Internet of Things. The Internet of Things is everything imaginable is going to have an IP address. Your dog's going to have an IP address. Your cat's going to have an IP address. Your left shoe and your right shoe is going to have IP addresses. Just as an example, this is a battery about to come on the market. If you put it in your smoke alarm, it will tell you on your cell phone if the battery's low, it'll, when you're away, it'll tell you something's happening. This is not, not, this is saying, warning, your master bedroom smoke alarm is sounding on your cell phone. That's not very rewarding if I'm in Dublin and it's telling me that you know, there's smoke in my bedroom in Prince Edward County. Uh, note, peace of, they say peace of mind. It'll, it'll change the stresses. I mean, you'll know. <laughs> uh, but it's not unlikely to be the case that in another 15 years, I should say another five years, that the average house will have a hundred or a thousand distinct IP addresses for that house. Your car will have a multitude of them. Uh, most of you have already got them. If you've got a smart meter, it's talking by IP to uh, 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 um, every device you've got hooked to the internet has an IP address. Some of them are permanent, some are temporary. You just get it when you're there. And then when you, when you go to get your mail, you know where to go look for your mail and mail comes to your temporary IP address. So, but the Internet of Things is the big explosion here. Um, and it's going to use billions and billions of, of these addresses for all the objects that you have that, that are going to be uh, connected to the Internet. Your car, your refrigerator, your, your stove, your front door, your lights. Um, okay. Okay. So, those, so those are the numbers. Well, and the machi machines are indifferent between numbers as identifiers, and we call these things identifiers. How do you, where am I, where is that? How do I get there and back here? Um, if I want to go to yorku.ca in binary form, it looks like that. Okay, now, if somebody wants to send me an email, they would prefer to use that rather than that. Remember that rather than that. That tells the machine what but not where. The IP address tells the sending machine in each way station uh, where to send the contents and where it came from. And so there are these master databases around the world in big server farms that, that keep all these IP addresses. And if they don't have all of them, they know where to send it next based on, on, on part of the IP address. And so who maintains those server farms? How do those databases stay current? Uh, in a country like Iran at the, at the moment, or even in Turkey, the government may come in and say, <coughs> close off some, make some of those IP addresses unaccessible, that you can't get there if you try and get there. You get a 404 error, you just get nothing. Okay, well, the machines could work with all that stuff, but as humans, we want to use a uniform uh, resource locator, which has two parts to it. One is a word we understand, like yorku.ca, and the other is, is it, is it a web page? Is it mail? Am I just checking to see if a machine is there? So we want these things to be written in a common language. Okay. And originally, that common language is English. But in the last 36 months, and basically in the last 18 months, we've been rolling out uh, email addresses in Chinese, in kanji, in, in, in uh, Indian languages, in Arabic languages, and in each of those requires doing a lot of work to make sure that there aren't collisions between various versions of the words and so forth. So there's a whole lot of work going into op going beyond the Roman languages and having a multitude of language scripts. And if you go to ICANN and just plug the stuff in it for language scripts, you get whole lists of stuff in a whole bunch of languages. Okay. So for that to work then, the internet eco ecosystem needs to be based on a stable and secure domain name system, DNS. So the top level of governance is about the stability and security of that DNS system. Is it stable? When you plug something in, does it go where it's supposed to do and come back? And is it secure? Can you know, malicious governments or individuals 
get in there and mess things up or not when you're making a deposit in your bank online? Is it going to your bank or is it going to somebody else? Okay. Well, that's where the sets of principles and operating rules, that's where these two organizations that most of you probably never heard of, ICANN and IANA, come into play. <coughs> okay. Maintain, and, and the purpose of these are to maintain a secure and stable domain name system. It sounds like something trivial, like giving people names, but it's, it's the heart of the internet. So ICANN is the Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers. Uh, when it started, it was kept in a file cabinet in, in a five, three by five plastic box on Jan Postal's desk in California. Now it's on massive servers around the world, server farms run by Amazon, Google, and others. The, the, they're the big cloud servers around the world. Um, and ICANN is a not-for-profit benefit corporation with participants from all over the world. This is their language, so it's a little bit of marketing. But it's a nonprofit organization registered in California, uh, which bothers some people. Uh, some people were thinking maybe they should move it to Switzerland. But then the FIFA scandals came out, and they discovered that things are not <laughs> much better in Switzerland. Uh, and then there's, a, then there's IANA, the Internet Assigned Numbers Authority. They're responsible for taking the policies set here and implementing them on, the, on this network of server farms and so forth around the world. Okay. And, uh, and they do that, the technical stuff is developed in, in consultation with a lot of groups, private sector, public sector, so forth. But two key players are the Internet Engineering Task Force and the Internet, Internet Architectural Board. And you can think of those as like subcontractors and contractors if you're trying to build a city. That they, this is, they're like the zoning people and they're like the technical people, the engineers and the electricians and so forth. Think of those as, as building the, getting the physical infrastructure correct in terms of the protocols. They don't really actually draw the wiring. The wiring is drawn by Bell Canada or CP Rail or somebody, or, or you know, the various players on the, on the infrastructure. And then the, but there's an important third group, and that's the National Telecommunications and Information Agency, NTIA, which is in the executive branch of the U.S. government and advises the president of, in the United States on telecommunications and information policy. And when IANA was created, the agreement was that eventually the US government would turn control over this. It's not control in that they make policy, it's a control in that they exercise uh, oversight to make sure that this does what that says this should do. Okay, well IANA, IANA's, uh, it also deals with broadband and broadband broad uh, decisions and allocating uh, spectrum for telecommunications and so forth. But it's the kind of watchdog to make sure that this does that, does the policies set there. Okay. So, and in a year, about a year and a half ago, uh, the President of the United States said, okay, we're going to hand this off. It's no longer going to belong to the United States. It's going to belong to the world. Well, what does it mean that it belongs to the world? Okay. That's why I'm saying that they exercised oversight until now. Okay. Well, so here's what IANA does. So it, it, it manages the root zone uh, system, the assignments. CCTLDs are country code top level domains. And GTLDs are generic top level domains. Uh, and these are the, and there's some other more specialized things. It does it for names and numbers, and then it has some other stuff here that has to do with sorting out what the protocols mean and so forth. But to give you an idea, generic top-level domains are things like .com, .net, .org, and we're in the process of rolling out over a thousand new ones. A Canadian company got .sucks. So if you don't like somebody, you can say, uh, you know, I've got Meta Spencer .sucks, and I've got a bunch of things I like to post because I don't like her. Right. And, uh, and if you're a company, you can, you can buy one of those to protect yourself. Um, so there's .ca, .uk, .fm. Uh, not all countries have, the, not all of them, there's some places that are not countries and have them. Like there's a .qc for Quebec. There's a .I think it's 
CA or no CAT or what. Catalonia has its own. The Basque region may get their own. Uh, some countries d have them like .LA is basically used to sell to companies in Los Angeles, although it's, it's a, a different country. Um, there's some countries that have a problem because these codes were, are, there's an international organization that sets country codes. And for, for reasons that are pretty obvious but unfortunate, the South Sudan's country code is .SS. And so, so the Sudan, South Sudan doesn't take .SS because of the history of the SS. And there are all kinds of Nazi groups out there that want them to get .SS because the skinheads would like to be on .SS. And so it, get, it, it gets fairly complicated. Um, okay. The National Communications and Information Administration of the U.S. State Department, just with what's new there, the fourth quarterly report on the transition of the stewardship of the IANA, of IANA. This is the process we've been involved in for the last year and a half. Uh, this is some of the things that it deals with, because it's more than just the governance, of, oversight of the governance of the internet, and that's just where I stole the wording, and that, you can see there are the, some of the things they deal with. Um, so that's IANA. Oh, I'm sorry, that's NTIA. And then the essence of this, this transition announcement is extremely important. Uh, NTA, NTIA is going to hand that off. Much of the technical cooperation from IANA is actually with Verisign. Verisign does the negotiations with the, the owners of the server farms around the world and so forth uh, to perform the root zone management functions. This includes making sure there aren't collisions between say, a, a, a kanji version of something or a Mandarin version of something and a, and a Cantonese version of a, an email address and so forth. So it's, uh, but the four conditions that have to be met for this transition to take place are it has to support and enhance the multi-stakeholder model. And most people are going, what the hell is that? Maintain the security, stability, and resilience of the internet DNS system. That's pretty straightforward. Meets the needs and expectations of global customers and partners in the IANA services. Yeah, uh, and that's everybody. Uh, and maintain the open, openness of the internet. So like with uh, Jessica and Siphone here, part of what they do is for countries that try and close down the openness of the internet, they provide ways to keep it open. And then we have generally you know, pushing and pulling to try and keep it open uh, uh, by getting countries to agree. Uh, it was, wasn't easy, but with bipartisan resolutions of the state uh, Senate and House of Representatives, the U.S. government came down supporting the multi-stakeholder model. If you go back and read the literature from a year ago, the Republicans are claiming you know, Obama's giving the, the Internet away, and, and, and there's all the political battles around that take place. Uh, but the interesting thing is that they won't accept proposals that replace the NTIA role with a government-led or an intergovernmental organization solution, which means the oversight cannot go to a UN agency. It cannot go to a multilateral agency. In particular, it cannot go to the International Telecommunications Union, which is a multilateral agency made up of the countries of the world. And it's been in trouble in recent years because its main source of revenue used to be a, a getting royalties on setting long distance phone rates. But with the growth of, of digital communications, long distance phone rates are set by whomever. I mean, Skype makes about $2 billion a year from the services that, that they're sold. Skype's owned by, it's Google, right? Um, or is it Microsoft, I forget. Anyhow, whoever owns Skype. They make about $2 billion a year in revenue, but they destroyed about $20 billion a year in long distance phone call rates. Uh, so the ITU would love to have control of this because it's a source of revenue for them. Mm -hmm. And the governments would, like the, would have liked the ITU to have control of it because then Pakistan would have a veto, the Soviet <laughs> Russians would have a veto, Albania would have a veto, well, Albania not so much. But, uh, so the, the transition is, is to, it has to take place in a way, in a multi-stakeholder model, where the possibility of capture of the political process is impossible. And that's what negotiations have been going on for the last year and a half, trying to figure out how to do, how to do that. Uh, you know, so, you know, and some of us, this is an aside, some of us think that at this point in time, 
this notion of a multi-stakeholder model of policy making for governance <laughs> may end up, it'll either just be a niche solution to problems in the 21st century, or it may, may be to the 21st century what the multilateral organizations and the UN were to the 20th century. If you remember back at the beginning of the 20th century, uh, we didn't go for the League of Nations. Uh, we didn't listen to John Maynard Keynes in the economic consequences of the peace when he explained what you had to have of things like a World Bank and, uh, and an International Monetary Fund and so forth. And then we got a half century of disaster with, you know, with pogroms and the Holocaust and war and so forth. And then we put those things in place. And some of them now are getting a little aged. They're getting a little brittle. They're not as flexible as they used to be. And so, it so some of us think that there's some possibility that the multi-stakeholder model is the next model of, of collaborative decision making that may emerge. It certainly has to emerge here because it's the only option that, that's left available. Oh, let me, there we go. Okay. So this is the, the two things, I'll make two points here that before I, I go into a little bit of this. These you can find online, so I'm not going to go through, through this in any detail, but and, and that's my question, is it, is it a 20th century, 21st century innovation, or is it a niche model for solving problems? Um, the multi-stakeholder model is bottom-up policy making. There's a policy development process, I'll say a word or two about that, that involves stakeholder engagement. If you come down here on who's involved, it's kind of hard to see these, but I'll go through them quickly. There are supporting organizations, uh, the addressing organizations, country code organizations, generic names organizations, and I won't go into the details of that. There are advisory committees that advise the political process. The only thing I want to point out, and it's hard to see it here, is that the governments in this process only play an advisory role. They have no say in policy. No say at all in policy. Uh, they can lobby and push and yell and holler and try and do tricky things and we, call them, we, we, we haul them back down and so forth. But here's something trying to set up the way the a level of the government, internet is governed, which I'll, I'll explain in the next slide, where the role of governments is to be there in an advisory capacity. They are not used to being in an advisory capacity. They're used to being the people who make the decisions. Okay. The other thing is if you look over here who's involved, the Board of Governors.
they don't have a court order, don't give it to them. And in fact, in London, the London police have just recently said they don't even go ask for access anymore because it's just too much trouble to get the court orders, so they just quit asking. Uh, so their policy data metrics, so the thick who is policy, that's what's, what should these ownership databases look like. Uh, this is what should be measured in terms of what's going on. If you don't measure it, you can't make policy. This translation transliteration one has to do with introducing domain names in kanji, in Arabic, in, uh, uh, in Hindi, and so forth. And then this last one is the new, new subsequent new GTLD pro procedures. They created an opportunity, which made a lot of money for ICANN and others, uh, to create new GTLDs, and they got 2,000 applications. It's boiled down to about probably 1,600 of them, of them will eventually be approved, and some of them won't make a penny and they'll die, and we're not quite sure how you make a, 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 a domain the dot string, the thing to the right of the dot, how, if, if that thing is going to die, what happens to the people who have a domain name uh, for, for that GTLD? Do they, do, do they get a postcard in the mail saying go somewhere else or what? These are all things that, that we have to sort out. We have to sort out. Okay. And just to make it clear, the registries own the rights to the GTLD, and the registrars sell domain name rights to customers and end users. And th these can be very big money operations. I mean, it, it, it ends up costing several million dollars just to apply for a GTLD. If you're found ineligible to be an applicant, you get most of the money back. But if you're eligible to be an applicant, that money is sunk, and how that gets sorted out as to who gets the GTLD is a fairly complicated process. It involves some private auctions, some public auctions, uh, uh, a lot of defensive moves when dot NYC, city, New York City got one. Uh, Michael Bloomberg bought 400 domain names just to protect himself. You know, Michael Bloomberg is a wiener. Michael Bloomberg is stupid. Dot NYC, so forth. But that wasn't enough. Some TV people went and got other insulting ones. Uh, in March, Donald Trump bought about 3,500, 3,200 domain names, covering a bunch of bases that he's concerned about. They had nothing to do with his political operations, I guess. I think. Okay. Okay. Now, so examples: the registry own rights. Uh, registries own the rights to the GTLDs. Dot com, you know. Dot sucks is a new one where I, I've, I've said publicly that the way they're selling their services, I expect uh, the RICO Act in the United States to put them in jail because it's basically extortion. They go to you and say. We'll sell you your domain name at a very high price so that somebody else doesn't buy it. Uh, Kinder, Kinder eggs, you know what those are? Those little eggs are legal here and illegal in the United States. I was just reading some British people tried to take 12 of them into the US and they argued with the authorities on the border from here. And so the authorities socked them $1,000 an egg. It cost them $12,000 and they couldn't keep, yeah. Uh, registrars sell the rights to domain names. Suppose you want war.sucks. It's probably available. Country code domain names, .s, as I've talked about. Restricted ones, .doctor, .bank. There's a lot of fighting over .health. I've been involved in some of that. Uh, and a lot of these issues have to get settled at that third level. Mm -hmm. ICANN cannot go around the world saying, uh, you're a doctor, you're not a doctor, and your country doctor means something else, so you can get a website and you can't, so forth. Those have to be handled in, at that top level, a lot of it at the national level. So <coughs> Proxy ownership, privacy, security issues, how to deal with human rights, cyber fraud, cyber crime, rights and obligations, dot city issues, dot new NYC, dot Berlin are out there. If they kick off a new round of, of global uh, generic top level domains, there are going to be business people trying to pitch this to the city of Toronto, and the city of Toronto better think very, very hard about whether it says yes or no, and if it says yes, negotiate it carefully. New York City agreed to have it, and the city was given, very much like the Trans-Pacific Partnership, the city was given a 6,000-page contract, and the public was given one day to look at it in a closed room and couldn't take any copies of it out. 
So in, there's an awful lot of lawyer fiddling in 6,000 pages, right, the details. So they, they've had a number of problems with it. And there, there are more and more of these. Uh, okay, so what are the IANA transition issues? I'm not gonna go into these in detail, but one is what is an appropriate and acceptable multi-stakeholder model that involves everybody from uh, Google and Facebook and IBM and General Motors and, and Hewlett Packard and, and Lockheed Aerospace down to community groups in Toronto and Ottawa. How does, how does that dynamic get put together? Uh, and the main question there is how do, you, how do you put it together in such a way that it can't be captured by one of those, one of those uh, sets of stakeholders, including capture by some of the governments? Uh, and, how is, and then how is this multi-stakeholder organization going to remain accountable to its mission? You know, who watches the watcher? You know, or the, so the policy is made here, but, but who's going to take over the NTIA version of oversight, watching, uh, holding oversight and stewardship, stewardship over this? Now the suspicion is at this point in time that probably ICANN itself will successfully become the multi-stakeholder institution organization that holds this because people are having a hard time figuring out how to build another one. Interestingly enough, earlier this year, the Indian government came on side and said, yes, we support the multi-stakeholder model. Whereas a year ago, they were, pri they were part of the group trying to get it handed off to the International Tele Telecommunications Union. So there's a lot of high level stuff going on in the background of all this. Uh, and, and, you know, and those are two things that if I said those are two big fights on the global political stage at the moment and they have to do with a multi-stakeholder model uh, where the organization's board has no policy making and the governments that are involved in an advisory capacity, you'd think I was making it up, except that's what's really going on. Okay, and this is, this is the top layer. I'm just gonna say a little bit about that. These issues, civic and human rights, how to deal with social media, uh, security and privacy, uh, how to deal with mobile stuff, what's, you know, various issues around entertainment and a lot of those are intellectual property rights issues. Um, just to give you an example how this gets complicated, a, a small Toronto press just came out with a, a book which has a series of articles that are James Bond articles. There are stories about, you know, they're James Bond episodes and they could do this because a certain amount of the copyright on James Bond material has expired, so it's in the public domain. And now the publishers are trying to figure out how do we come back and stop that. A whole lots of issues in education. Uh, a couple of them, for example, are, one of them is that under these, these new trade agreements, it may turn out that the agreement includes language that says that if you're trained as an accountant anywhere within the TT, uh, TTP, that you are allowed to compete for work anywhere in the TTP. So if the city of Toronto says we need an accountant, somebody from Montevideo can put in a bid, and, and, and you can't rule it out because they're in Montevideo. You have to consider it as a serious <laughs> bid. Uh, and then there are a whole bunch of things about net neutrality. should should the suppliers be able to block off various parts of the internet and say if you buy our product it gets to you fast. By product I mean digital like TV. And if you buy their product it's so slow. Rogers would love to slow Netscape down. Bell would love to slow Netscape, not Netscape, but Netflix down. Uh, because they'd prefer you to get, you know, get uh, video from them that's less choppy. Okay, so that's, That was like a fast overview, and what I want to do is just stop there and say, okay, uh, you've been exposed to some areas here that touch on what you're concerned about already, and some areas that are just completely new to you, uh, and I just would like to shift it over to you. You're the, you're the stakeholders here. Uh, comments, questions, uh, provocative, uh, innocent, whatever. Uh, thank you. Sorry.